Welcome to section 6.1 and 6.2. All right, gentle people, what we're going to do is we're going to begin with chapter 6. And chapter 6 is on this concept of equilibrium. So let's go ahead and take a look at these two reactions, reaction 1 and reaction 2 on this slot. Now, if you're an environmental scientist, this is one of the reactions that you may be concerned about. You see, one of the concerns environmentally is something called acid rain, and that's where our rainwater is slightly acidified. And here in these reactions, this is going to be represented by this, 2H plus ions. So this is going to represent our acidic rainwater. Now, if you're the type of person that likes to travel around, one of the things that you guys might look at are the statues around the world, particularly in Europe. Now, some of these statues are made out of marble, and marble has the chemical makeup of calcium carbonate. So one of the deleterious effects of acid rain is acid rain can react with the marble inside a statue. Now, if this happens, it takes that marble and turns it into calcium ions, carbon dioxide, and liquid water. And so in essence, what happens is acid rain starts to etch away at these beautiful marble statues. Now, here's a little interesting bit. If you go underneath some of these statues, and, and here's a picture of the basement of the Lincoln Memorial. What's happening here is you're starting to see calcium carbonate stalactites start to form on the ceiling. What's happening here is calcium ions are reacting with the CO2 in the air and the moisture in this basement, and they're reforming calcium carbonate and two units of H+, or a little bit of acid rain or acidic water. Now, if you take a look at these two reactions, you'll notice something very interesting. What you guys will see is that the reactants of reaction one are the products of reaction two. And what you'll also know is that the products of reaction one are the reactants of reaction two. So these two reactions are the same reaction, but they're in the opposite direction. And so this is the concept that I want to talk to you guys about. When we've been talking about chemical reactions, we've only said that they go in the four direction. We always read our chemical reactions as my reactants on the left-hand side going to my products on the right-hand side, and we only had reactants going to products. Now, this is going to change in these types of reactions in Chapter 6. What we'll have are equilibrium reactions. Now, an equilibrium reaction, my reaction can go in both directions. I can have my reactants go to my products, and what will happen is my products will also become some of my reactants. So what's going to happen is I'm never going to fully go to one side or the other. I'm going to reach what we call an equilibrium. Now, there are a couple of things that you have to understand with an equilibrium. So let's take a look at this first reaction up here. Now, the first way that you know you have an equilibrium is we're going to use a different type of arrow. So in our other type of chemical reaction, we used a hard arrow signifying we were going from reactants to products. Now, since my products have a chance to go and turn back into reactants, I'm going to use the equilibrium arrow. And that's going to be a double-headed arrow like this one. Now, when we go ahead and reach equilibrium, the equal in equilibrium does not refer to equal amounts of reactant and product. This is a misnomer. What the equal in equilibrium means is that the forward rate of reaction is equivalent to the reverse rate of reaction. Now, we're going to go ahead and talk about kinetics a little bit later, but all you want to know right now is that I am making as much products as I am consuming products. I'm making as much reactants as I am consuming my reactants. What happens is my concentrations don't change once I reach equilibrium. So let's go ahead and examine this reaction right here over time. So what I can say is at time equals zero, 
I'm going to have a whole bunch of reactants. So in this case, my reactants is N2O4. Now, as my reaction starts, I'm going to decrease the amount of my reactants, and I'm going to start to make my products NO2. Now, what's going to happen eventually, the amount of my products that I make is going to be the same as the amount of products that I chew up to make my reactants. So in other words, once I reach equilibrium, the concentration of my products does not change. The concentration of my reactants don't change. So they're not the same concentration, they're just concentrations that are not fluctuating once I've established equilibrium. Now another thing that I want you to understand is that equilibriums are dynamic. What that word dynamic means is that the reactions have not stopped. The reaction going forward and the reaction going backwards are still occurring. I haven't stopped my reactions. It's just that the reactions are proceeding in such a way that the amount forward is the, is the exact amount going backwards. So if you want to think about this, it's like me taking a step forward and a step back really, really fast. And if you asked a person, how far have I traveled? Well, I haven't traveled anywhere, but I am continuously moving backwards and forwards really, really fast. So with that said, what we can do is we can go ahead and establish what those concentrations are once I've reached equilibrium. And the way that we express this ratio is something called the equilibrium constant. Now this constant is independent of how much you start out with reactants or products, and it is only dependent on temperature. This is a constant. So let's take a general chemical equilibrium reaction. I'm gonna have reactants A and B, and they are going to make C and D my products. Now, what you guys will notice is these little letters in front, these are the coefficients. So I have to first balance my equation, and once I balance my equation, I can write my equilibrium expression. And that's going to be the equilibrium constant is going to equal my products, C times D, divided by my reactants, A times B. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise everything to their stoichiometric coefficients. So whatever number appears in the balanced chemical equation in front of C, that's what I'm going to go ahead and raise C, and I'm going to do that to all of the things in my equilibrium expression. Now, what I want you to know is this is usually denoted as Kc because it is based off a concentration. So usually the states of A, B, C, and D will be aqueous or they will be dissolved in solution and so you will have a molarity involved here and that's why you see everything in concentration brackets. There's a slightly different equilibrium constant and that is going to be called Kp. Now remember concentration and pressure are directly related to each other and we're going to talk about this in the next slide. But instead of expressing my equilibrium constant in terms of concentration, I can express it in terms of pressure. So again, we're going to have our reaction reactants A and B going to products C and D. And in front of these are my stoichiometric coefficients because I'm balancing my equation. And now this time I don't have things dissolved in solution. Everything is in the gaseous state. So what I can do is I can take the pressure of C and D and times them together, my products, divide it by the pressure of A and B, my reactants, where everything is raised to their stoichiometric coefficient. And so I'm going to put everything in terms of pressure when I go ahead and express a Kp, an equilibrium constant, in terms of pressure. Now, I do want to mention there is mixed Ks. I'm not going to worry about them. I think your book mentions them previously. Don't worry about this. I'm going to stick with Kc, things in terms of molarity, or Kp, things in terms of partial pressures. 
So let's go ahead and use a real reaction and not use those general reactions. So here's my reaction. I can take nitrogen, three moles of hydrogen, and I get two moles of ammonia. So if I want to go ahead and write the Kp for this, so Kp means I want everything in terms of pressures. I'm going to take my products. That's going to be the pressure of ammonia. I'm going to raise it to the power of two because there's a stoichiometric coefficient of two in front of it. I'm going to go ahead and divide this by the pressure of nitrogen and the pressure of hydrogen. These both are my reactants. And if I take a look at the stoichiometric coefficient, I'm going to raise nitrogen to one and I'm going to raise hydrogen to the third power. And so this would be my Kp. Well, I hope that made sense to you, Chem1B, and remember to stay safe.